Would you stand with me as we read? And while we do that, I'm going to ask my lovely wife to go get my sermon for me. <laughs> I think I left it in the office. I, uh, I hope I left it in the office. We're reading from Luke chapter 16 and beginning in verse 11 this morning. Luke 16, I'm sorry, in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Father Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we consider the things that are in this parable that you have given for our edification and that you've written in your word, so we know it's inspired by you. But Lord, even more authoritatively, this is coming directly from the lips of Jesus. These are things that are hard to preach on, they're hard to talk about, they're hard to contemplate. And yet it is truth that we need. And so we pray that somehow in these next uh, couple of weeks, as we look in detail at some of the things that are contained here, that you will be our teacher we pray that you will bring uh, comfort and conviction in the, in the, in the, uh, as they are needed in our own lives. That you will bring us, Father, to a point of true submission to you because that's the point of the whole thing. Thank you for bringing us together this morning and we pray that your name will be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. You didn't find it, did you? because I found it, so uh, <laughs> all is well. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm going to pay for this later. You all, you all know that, right? <laughs> well, I could explain why that all happened, but you wouldn't be interested. Naturalism which most of us are kind of raised with in one way or another, teaches us that this life is all there is, right? But deep down inside of us, there is this kind of this inherent desire for immortality that tells us that's a lie, that it's not true. The desire for immortality drives our ambitions. I remember a quote that I heard uh, from Lily Tomlin one day. She said, she said, I've always wanted to be somebody. Now I see that I should have been more specific. And uh, when I think about that, I think, you know what? That's a little bit what Jesus is saying here. You will be somebody. And you will choose that somebody. But you need to be specific because very important eternal things hang on what you choose. Hell is prominent in this parable, right? But it's the main point, as we saw last week, is it's talking about identity. It's talking about how to avoid hell by choosing the right identity here and now in this life. There are really two choices, self or Christ. I'm either depending on me or something I can do, have, or whatever else for my salvation, or I'm depending on him. And what choice I make will obviously depend, be, be, be um, uh, shown and demonstrated in the life that I live. Eternity hangs in the balance of what I choose with regard to this. So there are 
three main points that we're looking at in this parable. We looked at the first one last week. The eternal me is determined in this life. Called this me informed because at this point I still have a choice. I can still make that choice until the moment I die. The real me can be defined. Secondly, and this is what we want to begin to look at this week, death reveals but does not change me. This is me unveiled. The question is, who am I? Am I in Christ or am I in me? And if we're confused now, there will be no confusion the moment that we die. The true me will be unveiled at that point in time and it will be the me that I will be forever. Death is the final unveiling, if you will, of who I am and of what I have chosen and who I am in from an eternal perspective. Now, because of that, Jesus gives us kind of three points around that that are listed here in this, in this parable that I want us to see over the next couple of weeks. First of all, there will be surprises at that point in time. Many will be surprised. There will be suffering by many at that point in time, and there will be splendor for others. Wow, when you think about the consequences, beloved, that this parable points out to us, it is serious, serious business that Jesus is dealing with. So this morning I want to look at some, what are some of the surprises that are going to happen when people arrive in eternity? Number one, surprise. Some will be surprised to find out that death is not the end. Death is not the end. Naturalism, the philosophies of the day, whether it doesn't really matter whether they are the atheist, atheistic communistic philosophies or whether they are the scientifically driven naturalistic philosophies, they tell us that this life is all there is. Not Jesus. Notice he says in verse 22 of this parable that these two men die. But notice that in both cases, death is not the end. It's just the beginning. Death is the end of time in a sense, but it's the beginning of eternity. So death is not the end. A conscious, really in some ways more vivid, I think, existence, startling in its reality, will overcome all of us at the moment of death. C.S. Lewis calls the time that we live in now the shadowlands, and by that he means that everything that looks and seems so real to us is really just a shadow of what reality will be. And he's right. From a biblical perspective, that's true. The moment we die, we will know that death is not the end. It'll be kind of like, you know, welcome to eternity. Be ready or not, here you are. And so death is not the end. Bertrand Russell, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, said this. He said, there is darkness without, and when I die, there will be darkness within. This is a man, by the way, who lived quite a dissolute life in addition to his philosophical bents. He said, there is no splendor, no vastness anywhere, only triviality for a moment, and then nothing. Well, at least you can give him credit for being faithful to the logical conclusions of his naturalistic philosophy, right? He's really looked down over the abyss and said, I accept the conclusions that I'm driven to. There's nothing, there is no meaning, and there's not going to be anything to come. But here's the issue that we have to deal with. Bertrand Russell has never been in eternity. Jesus, who came from there, says differently. So who are you going to believe? I love the, uh, and I can't remember where I, I can't remember whether I actually heard this or heard of it, but it was Johnny, Johnny Carson one time, you know, the old talk show host that many of you spent too many hours watching. <laughs> I could never stay awake long enough, only on rare occasions. But he, uh, he was asked one time what his epitaph ought to be. His reply, I'll be right back. Doesn't that sound like just as he's breaking for a commercial, that's what he always said, I'll be right back. Of course, that was funny but only because everybody knew he wouldn't be right back. And when he died in 2005, he wasn't right back. He now knows, 
And Bertrand Russell now knows what Jesus already knew, death is not the end. Joseph Bailey, whom I've mentioned before, had three children, three out of their five or six, forget how many, that died at an early age, prayed this in the final sermon before his own death. He said, Lord, burn eternity into our eyeballs. That's what Jesus is trying to do here, beloved. He's trying to get us to look beyond just the here and now. Burn eternity into our eyeballs. A million years from today, we will all be existing. And I suppose in some ways, the 80 years or whatever it is that we get here will look pretty small at that point in time, right? But in light of the fact that the decisions made now have eternal ramifications, this 80 years will never seem insignificant. It's very significant. Burn eternity into our eyeballs, he prayed. Martin Luther lived that way. He said, I have two days on my calendar. He said, I have today, and he said, I have that day. And my goal is to live today in light of that day. That ought to be the goal of every one of us. It changes life when you begin to think about that. You do things you never thought you would do when you begin to understand that it's eternity that counts and that eternity is coming. The rich man lived only for today and he paid dearly. He got a bad surprise. Found out that death is not the end. So surprise number one, death is not the end. Surprise number two, hell is real. Hell is real. That will come as a surprise to a lot of people. We love to, I think if you took a survey, you would find the vast majority of people in our world believe that heaven is real or some kind of heaven is real. We even write books by that title. But we have a lot of doubts about hell. We want heaven to be real. So of course it is. We don't want hell to be real, so we have doubts about that. But Jesus had no doubts. He says of the rich man in verse 22, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. More than 20 times in the Gospels, Jesus either refers to hell, to Hades, or to the fires of judgment. Jesus, as we mentioned last week, spoke about hell more than any other person in the Bible. If we take Jesus' word about heaven, which we like to do, we have to take his word about hell. You can't have one without the other. The source of information about both is the same. It's all coming from the word of God, right? And frankly, the, the truth is, it's sort of built into us as a person as well. We know there is accountability. We deny it every way we can, but we know it's true. If we take Jesus' word about heaven, we must take his word about hell. You know, it, it feels good to deny hell. It, 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 feels, uh, it feels sophisticated. Our, our religious elite have told, our educated elite have told us, you know, they've long ago consigned the concept of hell to, the, to what they think is the garbage bin of ancient myth. But Jesus would remind them that heaven and hell are taught side by side. If you take away one, you must take away the other. I think people also forget that hell is necessary, beloved. Hell, the, the very thing that we, everybody wants, a world of peace, of no sin and no suffering and no anything else, right? Well, that's the world that, the, that Jesus is pointing us to. It's, the, it's, the, it's where history is going. It's where God wants to take us. It's where God is going to take us. But the only way that can happen is if those who will not conform to the will of God are not allowed in that place. Hell is a necessary other side to the love of God. As God loves those and saves those who will believe in him, so he must do something with those who will not. Denying reality doesn't make it so, does it? When I think about this, I always think about the, uh, and I've probably used the illustration before, but I think about how 
how Hitler was busily getting his military strength together in the 1930s, and in doing so, he was violating most of the, or many of the conditions of the terms of the armament that ended World War I. He was also gradually getting concessions from the Allies who just stuck their head in the sand for about seven or eight years during that period of time. They made little concessions thinking, that'll be it, and you'll be happy. About the last one of those was the Munich concession in 1938, right? When Prime Minister Chamberlain from England went to Germany and was absolutely bullied, if you read the history of it, bullied by Hitler into making this concession that gave away the Sudetenland, which Chamberlain didn't own anyway. Part of Czechoslovakia. But he gave it away, thinking this will be the last thing. He can't possibly ask for anything more. This is the end of it. He came home and declared, we have established peace in our time. There was one man who knew better. Winston Churchill, history tells us, stood outside the Savoy Hotel in London, England as Chamberlain and his party of, of uh, constituents who had been at this summit were celebrating their victory. And Chamberlain said this, he said, these poor people, they little know what they have to face. And nine months later, they faced it. And for the six years after that, it was hell on earth in England, wasn't it? Denying reality doesn't make it not true, beloved. If heaven is real, so is hell. Hell is real. Here's a third surprise. People go to hell. People go to hell. I hope you understand it pains me to say that. It pains me to think about it. I say it with no harshness in mind, with no thoughts of anything other than there's a glorious good God who has arranged all this, and so I know in the end it will be for his glory. But it is so hard to realize people will go to hell. We don't like that. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to contemplate it. We consistently want to think a God of love could never do this, but the Bible, over the same Bible that tells us about the God of love tells us over and over and over and over again that this is the fate of those who pit their will against God's. Isaiah 64, 66, verse 24. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched. Matthew 5, 22. Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Hell will be filled with people. It will be filled with many people who knew Jesus personally, you know, that shook his hand. They gave him a kiss on each cheek in keeping with the way you greeted people in those days. That sat and listened to his sermons that were stirred in their hearts perhaps, but many of them will be in hell. Jesus says in Luke 13, verse 26, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says in Luke 10, verse 15, and you, Capernaum, which was his adopted hometown during the time of his ministry, you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. He's not talking about the streets of Capernaum, beloved. He's talking about the people of Capernaum, right? He's talking about the people who lived in the houses that he walked past every day of his life in those days. He's talking about those people, people that are today, as we sit here in this place, are in hell and have been there now for 2,000 years. That's who Jesus is talking about. I realize that hell was made for the devil and his angels, but it will include people who choose to follow the example of Satan and therefore will share his eternal destiny. 
And they say, oh, this is great because I'm certainly not a follower of Satan. Listen, listen really, really carefully to this. You don't have to belong to satanic clubs in order to be a follower of Satan. You know that, right? You don't have to be one who worships at the altar of the witches and all of the things that go on in the name of Satan that we think of as satanic worship. To follow Satan to hell takes only one thing, and that is that you follow him in pitting your will against God's. Remember, Satan's sin, according to Isaiah 14, verse 14, was what? I will make myself like the most high. I will be my own God. That's all it takes. Satan doesn't care whether you bow down and worship him in person. He just cares if you worship you. That's all. If you are your own God, you will share his destiny. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. People will join him there. Those who join Satan there will be those who have joined him in rejecting God And rejecting God doesn't mean to deny his existence. It doesn't mean to say he's not real. It just means to put him over here while you live your life over here. You can't do that. That's why the Bible warns it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you know know why people, you know why people like to deny hell? It's really pretty simple. It's, It's illustrated it's illustrated by a story that I heard from a friend of mine, Mike Corcus. He's a pastor in Southern California. He was, he was a youth pastor at one time, and he told about one night when they were in a, in a youth group, and they were talking about this subject. And one of the girls said, well, listen, the Bible says that God is a God of love. Then it says that God sends people to hell. How can a loving God do that? And they got into a big discussion about that. And Mike raised a lot of the same points that we're talking about today and answered that question as best he could, but pretty soon the discussion really degenerated into an argument. And so they dismissed the meeting, and when they got all done, he he, he called the young lady over and he said, listen, I, I owe you an apology. I should never have let that discussion degenerate into an argument like this and got an argument of men of with you, but let me just share with you the gospel. Let me share you what, what the Bible says about how you don't have to go to hell. And he began to share with her about what Jesus has done to die for our sins. But he said the first thing you have to acknowledge is that you do have sin. And he read to her Romans 3.23, one of our verses. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as he read that and as he began to press that point, the young girl began to cry and then she began to sob uncontrollably. And it turned out that she knew she had sin in her life. This was a high school senior and she was involved in a sexual relationship with the married man. As a result of the discussion they had this time, she realized what Jesus had done for her. She realized the life he had lived for her. She realized the death that he had died for her and she accepted Jesus as her savior. When they got all done, she said, you know what, Mike? She said, the reason I don't want to believe in hell is because I knew I was going there. That's why people don't want to believe in hell because deep in our hearts, we all know that's what we deserve. We know that if God truly looks at the hearts and not just at the outward appearance, we are doomed. People don't want to believe in hell because they don't want to be accountable. And so we allow our minds to deny what our hearts know to be true. There is accountability. And if there is accountability, there is hell. And that's why a lot of people will be surprised in hell. But beloved, the answer to the hell issue isn't to deny it. The issue is to repent. That's where forgiveness is. That's where escape is. That's why Jesus gave this parable. So we understand that it's real and that people go there, but there is escape. So death is not the end. Hell is real. People go to hell. Point number four. Good people go to hell. Good people go to hell. Now, I, this, this may be the biggest surprise of all. I don't know. But to his utter shock, this rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell. You, expect, you think he expected to be in hell when he died? That was the last thing he expected. Now, keep in mind the community would have looked at this man as an upstanding 
representative of the community. He was a good man. The Pharisees knew that this guy represented them and they would have taken great issue with this. His very prosperity, the reason Jesus makes him a rich man, one of the reasons is because the the Pharisees would have said, "If if you got money, if you're rich and you don't have any physical disabilities, that's a sign of God's blessing on you. They would have said, this man is righteous. Everything about him says that he's righteous. He's a good man. And the, and the Pharisees considered themselves good, right? They were doing everything they could think of to obey the law of God as they interpreted it. That's the whole reason they were doing it. You say, well, isn't good intention enough? And my answer is no. It isn't. Because good intentions is just another way of worshiping yourself. Do you see? Instead of God. Good people. Well-intentioned people who will not repent of their selfishness go to hell. I think a lot of us are willing to admit, okay, people go to hell. We, we know that. We see it in the Bible and so on. But that's, you know, it's for, the, it's for the Osamas of the world. It's for the Hitlers of the world. It's for the Stalins of the world. Sure, those guys go to hell. They deserve it. Hell is not for good people. And yet here is Jesus depicting a good person going to hell. He didn't pick the most radical rebel in Jerusalem to be the representative in his parable, right? He picked a good man and he pictures him lifting up his eyes in hell. What what gives? How is it? Why is this? Why is it that Jesus would depict good people going to hell? Well, listen, here's the first point we need to understand. There are no good people. There are no good people. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, Romans 3. All we like sheep, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, Isaiah 53. There are no good people. You say, well, what are you saying? We're all Saddam Hussein's? No, of course not. You consider yourself a good people? I, I consider myself a good person? We know there are good people. We know that there are people who are trying to do right, including ourselves. But there's a problem. There's a problem. And the problem is that God looks on the heart while man looks on the outward appearance. And when God opens the heart of every one of us, what does he, what does he see? He sees underneath all the, all the good intentions and all, uh, underneath all of the g- good activities that we get involved in, he sees the salvation foundation that's beneath all of it, right? Right? Our heart is a black mess of horror. That's what the law is about. Dr. Law was given by God to tell us, you've got a heart problem. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. This man who looked very so good on the outside had a heart problem. Why? He's just interested in himself. As we saw last week, he isn't even such a bad, he doesn't kick Lazarus every time he goes by. He just ignores him. Because he's into himself. We're all condemned, beloved, by our own goodness because our goodness is selfishly motivated. A thousand Americans were asked, if you were to die tonight and God said, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you answer? 80% of them said something that pointed to their goodness. That's the answer I get most of the time when I ask somebody that question myself. Something they've done, something they're trying to do. Usually it's, you know, it's usually either get the baptismal certificate. I think I've said this before, but you'd be amazed how many people go looking for that when I ask that question. And the other one is, well, I'm doing my best. I want to cry when I hear that. Your best will never make it. Do you know that? Your best will never make it. I've gone to church for 30 years. I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I do my best. R.C. Sproul, one time I heard him, he was talking about his old professor, Dr. John Gerstner. He said, he said some, some, some uh, student in one of these classes in seminary had a bad grade on a paper, and he came to Dr. Gerstner. He said, but Dr. Gerstner, but I did my best. And he said, Gerstner looked him straight in the eye, and he said, son, you have never done your best. That's true. We've never done our best, number one, but in, in, secondly, even if we did do our best, 
it would fall so short of the perfection of God. Could never possibly measure up. Hell will be filled with surprise good people who have done their best. Listen, here's the thing. The pride in their own performance which is keeping them from trusting in Jesus' performance on their behalf is the thing that will send them to hell. Many will say, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Have you ever done that? Some will be able to say that in all honesty one day. And do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Unrepentant good people go to hell. It's only repentant bad people who go to heaven. Repentant sinners, those who've acknowledged who they are before God, who've humbled themselves before the righteousness of God, said, I could never measure up. Thank you for sending Jesus to do that for me. Good people go to hell. Fifth thing we learn here, surprise. Position here in this life is not predictive of position there. We kind of started this last week, so let me just summarize what we learned there. Earthly success is no predictor of heavenly acceptance, right? So when Jesus told this parable, the rich man in this life is rich. Lazarus has nothing. The rich man is in, Lazarus is out. The rich man dines sumptuously every day. Lazarus just wants a crumb off the table. The rich man is revered here in this life. Lazarus is a nobody. The rich man is in comfort. Lazarus is in torment. But then they die. And now look at the reversal that's happened. Lazarus is now rich and the rich man has nothing. Lazarus is in, the rich man is out. Lazarus is dining sumptuously every day at the table of the Lord. The rich man just wants a cup of cold water. Lazarus is in comfort. The rich man is in torment. Lazarus is revered. He has a name in heaven, as we saw last week. The rich man is nobody. What happened? What happened is verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. What's happened? Both men got exactly what they wanted. You have to understand that, beloved. Both men got exactly what they wanted. The rich man wanted his things with God over here in the corner someplace, and that's what he got. Lazarus, whose name meant helped by God, wanted God. And even though he didn't have a whole lot in this life, eternally he got God. Both men got what they wanted. They both got what they chose. The rich man with his things was into self. Self was his God. Self was the one he worshipped. Self was his highest good, not God. But what he found is that self has a very short shelf life. Try to say that three times fast. I had to practice that. I got it out. Self has a short shelf. Shelf life, it doesn't last long. And the, the things that he made ultimate in his life, they disappeared at death. And so what he was trusting in to save him was gone. When he died, he built his identity on things. That's what he was about. They did not have any lasting value. They did not follow him into eternity. He got exactly what he chose, an eternity without God. Tim Keller, when he, when he was speaking on this one time, he, he said, you know, you've got to look at what's ultimate in your life. What are you, what's your God? What is your God? What do you live for? 
What is it that you couldn't live without? What, if you, what is it that if you didn't have it, you would say life is not worthwhile? What is that? And if it's anything other than God, if it's anything short of God, then you've got an idol, and it's very likely that that idol is taking you in the same direction that this man idol took him. And it doesn't matter what it is. You know, it could be, it could be anything. It could be money. It could be wealth. It could be ambition. It could be control. It could be comfort. It could be ease. It could be hobbies. It could be family. It could be relationships. It could be anything. Anything that you're living for that's not God. Anything that you're, that's your salvation. That's the thing that, you're, that, you, that you can't live without. That if it went away, you know, why did, why did guys, when the depression happened in 1929, throw themselves off buildings in New York? Because they lost the thing that was most important to them, right? And it still happens today. Why do people take their life? Because they lost the thing that was most important to them and it turned out it wasn't God. And if it's not God, it can't stand the test of eternity. We put our faith in those things that are temporal, those things that cannot last, those things that will be gone when we're gone. Success here does not define success there. That's why Jesus is urging your heart is the thing you must look to and and your heart must be after God. He's the only thing that lasts. One final surprise. There are no Second chances, not after death. It's popular today in a lot of theological circles. And you may not see this as much as I do, but you you will. Because it's becoming very popular to suggest that there are second chances after death. That a loving God would not send people to hell without a second chance after death. Now, not all of these people are universalists, meaning they're not all, all, not all of them believe that everybody eventually is going to find their way to heaven. Some of them suggest there'll be a few really, really, really bad people, the Osamas again, and the Hitlers again, who will not even with the greatest of evidence choose for God. But they will be few and far between. Most people, if they've rejected here, they will accept over there. The only problem is there is absolutely no indication of Scripture that this is true. This parable given by Jesus to give us insight into what is eternal truth doesn't give any indication that there is a second chance. The you that you die with will be the you that you live with eternally. In fact, he makes that point in verse 26, doesn't he? He says, besides all this, between us and you, between heaven and hell, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none can pass from there to us. There's no passing from heaven, from hell to heaven, beloved. There's no going between places here after you die. No second chances. Hebrews 9.27 tells us it is appointed unto man once to die and after that comes judgment. Listen, when you die, the earthly record is closed. The books are shut. The register is sealed. The record is completed and the consequences are now fixed. They can't be changed later. There's no going back. Do you ever have a dream where you fall off a high building or you know, do something other stupid where you, you, you know, you're, you're going to die in a couple seconds, right? But you have time to think in between and you're thinking, oh, if I just hadn't taken that step. Maybe it's just me, but I've had that dream a few times over the years. If I just hadn't taken that step, if, I just, if I'd just been a little more careful. But it's too late. This will be a surprise to many in eternity to find. There's no second chance. It's now or never. Walter Hooper was C.S. Lewis' secretary. He got a chuckle one day when he somehow walked past a grave inscription that he saw. It said, here lies an atheist, all dressed up with no place to go. He thought that was funny, so when he got in the office, he told C.S. Lewis about it, and Lewis 
looked at him very straight faced. He said, you know what, that atheist probably wishes now that that were true. So will a lot of people. But you will be dressed up and there will be somewhere to go. Hell is simply our freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. In other words, we reject him here so we will live without him forever. And again, the rejection doesn't mean that we deny his existence or even don't pray to him once in a while when we get into a tough fix. But the issue is, is he your God? Is he the one you live for? Is he what your life centers around? Or does it center around you? Are you ready? If you were to die this moment, what would the eternal you be? Yogi Berra famously said, you know, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. You come to a fork in the road, take it. But of course, it's not that simple, is it? When you come to a fork in the road, you gotta decide. You can't just go both ways. There's just one way that you can choose. And the Bible says, Jesus warned in another place, don't stay on the broad road that leads to destruction. Take the narrow way that leads to life. You're at a fork in the road this morning, beloved. If you've never been there before, you are now. One fork in the road reads, life eternal with Jesus Christ. The other fork reads, eternal separation from God in hell. Which way will you go? Which way will you go? Alice in Wonderland, you know, she came to a fork in the road. She said to the Cheshire cat, she said, well, which way would you tell me, please, should I go? The cat re responded, well, that depends on where you want to go. Alice replies, I don't much care. And the cat says, well, then it doesn't make any difference which way you go. But if you care, beloved, if you want an eternity with God, now's the time when you got to make the reservation. Now's the time. Listen, here's the good thing. Even if you're Lazarus, laying at the gate and begging, I'll tell you what, inside you're going to be happier and more satisfied than the rich man that lives in the house, even in this life. But you will certainly reap the benefits in the life that comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, from the, from the bottom of my heart, I plead that you would have helped this to be spoken with compassion and to be received in that spirit. But you preached it, not me. You made the points clear, not me. You set the boundaries because you knew, you and the Father, when you planned it all before time ever began, you knew what would most glorify God and this is the route you chose. Lord, we are not without, even though we don't like this, we don't care for the results, we don't like perhaps the message, you've done everything that you can do to make it possible for us to have an eternity with you. It's over to us now. No one will ever be able to say an eternity, it was God's fault that I got here. Won't happen. So I pray that you will do the heart work, Lord, that only you can do that we can't do. Bring us to yourself. Those hearts that are not sure this morning, help them to come to faith in you, to confess their sins, to acknowledge their need of you. And Lord, if they've got any questions, help them to come. Don't let them go away. They're coming and saying, I'm not sure. Can you help me? So we pray for that in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.